We're going to start. Okay. Okay. So, just a, it's about twenty minutes to what I said beforehand. Then twenty minutes. Glass of water. Of you and I. And then you and I. Good evening, everyone, and welcome, welcome to all. Welcome to the two hundred to the two thousand. Maybe 200 sounds better. Welcome to the 2017 George Washington Leadership Lecture. For those of you I haven't met, I am Sarah Colson, the 22nd region of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. The organization. I think she's brand new. This is the organization that purchased this estate from the Washington family in 1858 when neither the federal government nor the Commonwealth of Virginia could or would. And over the past 160 years, we have continued to preserve and restore George Washington's beloved home. And each year we welcome mi millions of visitors from around the globe. Since inception, the association has been exclusively run by women, never more than one representative per state. We come together officially as a board several times a year in council and our fall gathering begins tomorrow. Before we start this evening, I would like to recognize and thank those vice regents of the Ladies Association who have arrived early to be here for this important event. Ladies, would you please stand? <laughs> it's, a pleasure to ser it's a pleasure to serve with you. Thank you for your incredible work not only in preserving Mount Vernon, but in seeking to educate the world on the life and lessons of George Washington. I would also like to take a moment to especially thank our Vice Regent for California, Mary Beth Borthwick, and her husband, Hal, who joins her tonight. Mary Beth is a USC alum, and it is their generous gift that enabled this important partnership between our two institutions to flourish. Please join me in thanking Mary Beth and Hal. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Knott, who is the C. Irwin and Ioni L. Piper Chair and Professor and Dean of USC's Sol Price Public S the S of USC's Sol Price School of Public Policy. Dean Knott earned his master's degree in economics and comparative politics from the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and he earned his PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. Dean Knott is a leading scholar in the fields of political institutions and public policy, health policy, and public management. He has published three books, including Reforming Bureaucracy, The Politics of Institutional Choice, as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters. In 2007, Dean Knott was elected to the National Academy of Public Administration, one of two congressionally chartered national academies. It is now my privilege to and I hope you will join me in welcoming Dr. J Jack Knott. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and All right. <laughs> How's that? Uh, let me try it that again. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of the USC Sol Price School of Public Policy, and I'm really glad you could join us tonight for the George Washington Leadership Lecture. Uh, since we've gathered here in historic Mount Vernon, I thought it might be worthwhile to uh, and fitting this evening to give a little bit of uh, trivia about presidential history. Uh, did you know that according to the White House Historical Society on this very day, 116 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt officially named the president's residence and workplace the White House. That was done on this day. Uh, it was actually informally called the White House much earlier than that, going back all the way to 17, uh, 
98 when it was built because it was uh, the stone was covered with lime whitewash, which gave it a the whitish color. And they did that in order to keep the stones from freezing. So the George Washington Leadership Lecture Series, uh, as was mentioned, was lost, l launched in 2013 as a partnership, really, between the USC Price School and the Fred W. Smith National Library. And together, our goal was to explore President Washington's lifelong accomplishments, providing a better understanding of him as a person, as well as his remarkable leadership, professional achievements, and lasting legacy. We've designed the lecture to be bi-coastal, <laughs> so we typically host a fall lecture here at Mount Vernon, and then each January we bring the conversation to Cal Southern California. I also uh, really appreciate it that Mary Beth and Hal Borthwick were so gave their generous gift uh, to make this possible and that they can attend tonight as well. And we're very pleased to co-host this with the Fred W. Smith Library, including the library's founding director, uh, Dr. Doug Bradburn. Some of you may not be fully uh, familiar with the Price School, so I just want to say a couple words about it. <coughs> In his inaugural address nearly 230 years ago, George Washington referenced ideals such as the pursuit of the public good, a regard for the public harmony, and the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty. The Price School draws inspiration from these words and embraces the values they represent underscoring the work we do is a commitment to public service and to shaping the world for the better. And we prepare our students to be leaders, problem solvers, and e innovators, whether in government, business, or the nonprofit sector, really committed to doing good and making a difference in our, in our communities. 12 USC Price School students are here tonight, which I'm very pleased about. This group is part of our first ever Washington, D.C. career trek organized by our Career Services Office, where they have an opportunity to engage with public, private, nonprofit employers in the D.C. area. Could the USC Price students raise your hand? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> in addition, uh, the Price School was established more than 85 years ago, making it one of the oldest and the one of the highest ranked public affairs schools uh, in the nation. It's a truly interdisciplinary school with academic programs in the fields of public administration, nonprofit leadership, health policy and management, public policy and urban planning and real estate development. And in an interesting way, George Washington work, George Washington's work aligns with the, that of the Price School. He contributed to shaping the fields in which our faculty do their research and which we teach our students. Think about it. He was a government leader, a military leader, a surveyor, a city planner of Washington, D.C., a real estate developer in Ohio, and an innovator in disease prevention and healthcare practices at Valley Forge. So, in partnership with the uh, Fred W. Smith Library, we really look forward to advancing the study of George Washington and to convening events like this that help everyone better understand the ever-changing political environment. Tonight, our discussion takes place at our time when our nation grapples with increasing polarization, an increasing lack of civil discourse, and a growing inequality. Between 1789 and 1791, George Washington embarked on a series of arduous journeys intended to introduce the American people to the new president. Through his travels, he also hoped to bring together the residents of the disparate and often conflicting states into one United States. In tonight's lecture, Secretary Cisneros will discuss the current political and social polarization, including the disparities between the coastal areas in the inland regions, as well as be the big urban-rural divide that we confront as a country. Using examples from his really wide experience in the public and private sectors, he will, uh, I know, illuminate the ways we can better help bring people together. And so I'm really looking forward to a terrific and very insightful conversation. So at this time, I'm really pleased to introduce Doug uh, Bradburn, 
Uh, Dr. Bradburn is the founding director of the library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. He's a well-known scholar in American history. He has authored two books and numerous articles and book chapters on the nation's founding and the early history of the Chesapeake. He's also the co-founder of the book series Early American Histories at the University of Virginia Press. Before coming to Mount Vernon, he served as a professor of history and director of graduate studies at Binghamton University, then State University of New York. And he received there the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2010, which is a very important kind of award to, to uh, have gotten. In addition, he serves on the advisory council of the McNeil Center for Early American History and Culture in Philadelphia. And he also, <coughs> in his spare time, consults on documentaries for the news media. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bradburn. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to kick off the program this evening. Uh, this partnership is fantastic. It's been going on for a while. I don't know if many of you are there, but this is the fifth Saul Price lecture at Mount Vernon. It was the first public program we did in the Washington Library. Uh, and so it, uh, in that sense, is, uh, is close to my heart. And uh, I was just saying that we did some recent numbers on the public programs we've done since the libraries opened, including the educational programs and the leadership programs, and we've had uh, 20,000 people since 2013. So it's been uh, a great ride and a great success. Uh, my job in this moment, uh, and one thing about these Saul Price lectures, there's always a lot of introducing of people, because with partnerships, you know, you gotta make sure everybody's uh, happy. Uh, but my role is uh, I, I get to be a little bit of my old professor self here and get my pound of flesh out of the audience uh, before the program begins. I'm going to frame the historical context a little bit around George Washington and this great legacy of his uh, to encourage his fellow countrymen and women to uh, behave better and to be a little less partisan. Uh, and so the great legacy, of course, comes from his farewell address. And so I want to talk about that momentarily before I introduce our illustrious speaker uh, and panel tonight. Uh, now, uh, the farewell address, as you know, used to be memorized by school children throughout this country, throughout the 19th century. Uh, it is, however, 6,000 words, and so uh, modern attention spans are not so eager to dig into the farewell address like they used to do. It is, of course, read every year in the United States Senate. Uh, whether or not it has an impact, uh, I will leave up to you uh, to decide. Uh, but the three key components in that farewell address related to the challenge of getting Americans to work together to solve the problems, to do uh, what is the mission of the Saul Price School, to make the world a better place for everybody. Uh, and essentially, uh, Washington frames it in this way. The first way he talks about is, uh, is the importance of union. He kicks off, you know, the first 800 words or so of the farewell address are basically him saying thank you uh, and I'm leaving. So, uh, uh, but then he says, you know, I have some parting words. I'm departing. I have no other motive than that of friendly advice. He says, you are a liberty-loving people. Americas love liberty, and there's no recommendation necessary to confirm that attachment. But he says, your love of liberty uh, will fail unless you uh, focus on what unites you as a people, on union. The notion of the union is essential to you as a people. We often talk about our differences and the things that make us different, and Washington wanted to remind Americans to constantly work to think about those things in which you share. We are all distinct and different, but in fact, uh, the things that, uh, that bring us together are crucial and important to recognize. Uh, it is, he, he said, the main pillar in the edifice of your real independence. It is the very liberty which you so highly prize is dependent upon. Uh, you are one people, and he, in this case he said citizens, uh, born and adopted citizens, are one people of the country. We've fought together and bled together, and you should cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment uh, to uh, your community as a people, your union. Accustomate yourself to think and speak of it as the palladium of your political safety and prosperity, watching for its preservation with jealous anxiety, this sense of union discountenancing whatever may suggest even a suspicion that it can in any event be abandoned and indignantly frowning 
upon the first dawning of every attempt to alienate any portion of our country from the rest. So he's, he's calling for this emphasis on finding those attachments which make you into one people. He uses a word, uh, sensibility, in, this, in the farewell address. He calls upon the sensibility of the people. Now, sensibility is an 18th century concept uh, which was very popular in Washington's era and, in fact, in the Revolutionary era. And what it spoke to was uh, your emotional attachment. So, you know, if you know Jane Austen, you know the book Sense and Sensibility. Sensibility is the opposite of sort of the mind. It's the heart and the mind. Uh, and so the heart needs to be uh, um, uh, crucial in this effort to sort of find ways that you can have affection for each other as a people and that you can be one people together. This notion of empathy, be empathetic of the challenges and the sacrifices that your fellow countrymen have made. It's fundamental. And in this sense, Washington's not talking about sentiment in the 19th century sort of schmaltzy sense of sentiment. He, he's talking about it in the way that Adam Smith uses it in his theory of moral sentiments, that uh, it, it, these are crucial to making a society work together. It, it leads to moral improvement, and that's crucial to the success of the Union as a whole. So Washington lays out all these notions, but he basically says, but forget about all that, because really emotions aren't going to do it alone. You have to remember that the Union is fundamental to your interests, your pocketbook interests, all the things you care about, your property, your family security, the security of you as a people, uh, your notion of your community as a union is fundamental to that. So never forget your home and hearth, everything you care about, uh, and your security, your prosperity is dependent upon this sense of belonging and this sense of union. Now the second part to his uh, notion about how to get the country to work together uh, is more famous perhaps, and it's his, uh, his, his arguments to beware of the spirit of party partisanship. Now, you know, in his presidency, we really saw the polarization of the country into rival camps, Hamiltonians and Jeffersonians, very different visions for the future of the country, very different visions about what the foreign policy will be. And ultimately, his own administration was filled with this kind of frustrating partisanship. He says, yes, partisanship exists everywhere. It's part of human nature. But in representative governments, it can create a, a terrible domination, quote, of one faction over another, which leads to revenge. Uh, it could lead to an ambitious despot, and he wants everyone to work and guard against it, to discourage and restrain harsh rhetoric. Don't foment and circulate things that are going to drive people into partisan hands. He talks about a list of problems created by excessive partisanship. And that's the sense of it. It's an excessive partisanship that he's really warning about. It will enfeeble the administration of government. It will agitate the community and make this bonds of union seem less important. It kindles animosity. It foments riots and insurrections which threaten the security of all. And it opens the door to foreign influence. The idea that foreign governments will take advantage of a hyper-partisan environment and try to continue to sow discontent. He, he writes, quote, it is a fire not to be quenched. It demands a uniform vigilance to prevent its bursting into flame, lest instead of warming, it should consume. You know, in Washington's sense of partisanship, you know, he is reflecting on you know, his own inability to sort of keep his cabinet from falling into these, these challenges. Uh, and in essence, you know, Americans get the government that we deserve. He's putting it on citizens' responsibilities collectively to work together to not allow extremism to flourish. Uh, finally, he has in the farewell address uh, a notion that we need to have high expectations of public officers. That it is our role to remind them uh, of the station that they have, and they need to respect themselves, not only to confine themselves within the sphere of power, but also be recognize uh, the fragility of the political experiment of which they're a part. Uh, a massive democracy on a great scale of a multitude of diverse people. Uh, I want to close the historical context with a quote from Washington, uh, you know, and I think we can read it in a bittersweet way, and I'll say why in a moment. Uh, but he's, uh, he's in a moment where his cabinet, uh, Hamilton and Jefferson, are really at each other's throats, and they're disagreeing over the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, about foreign policy, and he's trying to keep one of them from resigning. He's trying to keep his cabinet together. 
and he'll go back and forth with very similar conversations with both. And he, and he writes, this is to Hamilton, but he does a similar thing to Jefferson. He writes to Hamilton, without more charity for the opinion and acts of one another in government matters, or some more infallible criterion by which the cru truth of speculative opinions before they have undergone the test of experience are to be forejudged than has fallen to the lot of infallible man. I believe it will be difficult, if not impractical, to manage the reins of government or to keep the parts of it together. My earnest wish and my fondest hope, therefore, is that instead of wounding suspicions and irritable charges, there may be liberal allowances, mutual forbearances, and temporizing yieldings on both sides. Under the exercise of these, matters will go on smoothly and, if possible, more prosperously. Without them, everything must rub. The wheels of government will clog, our enemies will triumph, and by throwing their weight into the disaffected scale may accomplish the ruin of the goodly fabric we have been erecting. Now, this is what he wrote to Hamilton, and, of course, I think it's bittersweet in the sense that it is an earnest wish, and it didn't necessarily work. You know, uh, and I think that's one thing we can both take heart from and encouragement from, is that extreme partisanship has been a part of American politics from the beginning. Uh, but that doesn't mean we're, we aren't responsible for it at some level, and we're not responsible for trying to find a way uh, forward, as Washington was encouraging us in his farewell address. Uh, and as I said, Washington's advice is still read every year in the Senate on his birthday, so hope springs eternal, I think. Now tonight, Henry Cisneros is going to guide us uh, through this troublesome challenge. Look at him, he's shaking his head. Yeah, I know there's a secret remedy here uh, to bring partisans together, but he's been doing it. He's been doing it successfully, and he'll talk a little bit about that, bringing partisans together to make positive change in the world. Uh, he is a doctor, the Honorable Henry Cisneros, founder and chairman of City View, chairman of the executive committee and principal of, of Siebert, Cisneros, Shank, and Company. He served three terms uh, as before his uh, uh, private career. He served three terms as a city council member. In eight, 1981, he was the first Hispanic American mayor of a major U.S. city of San Antonio, Texas. He served four terms as mayor. He was p almost the Democratic nominee for vice president in 1984, uh, almost. But that means he didn't, he didn't have to lose then in that election. <laughs> so I think there's some people from the Reagan Library here today, too. So. Uh, there's one, I see him right there in the audience, yeah. Uh, so in 1986, he served as the outstanding mayor in the nation by C City and State Magazine, he selected. Uh, he was appointed by President Clinton as Secretary of U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, he's credited in that role with initiating the revitalization of many of the nation's public housing developments. If you remember the 90s, it was a really important time uh, for transformation there. It certainly was in Chicago, where I was living at the time. He formulated policies which contributed to achieving the nation's highest ever home ownership rate in the 90s. In the role as the president's chief representative to the nation's cities, he personally worked in over 200 U.S. cities and in every one of the 50 states. After leaving uh, HUD in 1997, he became president and COO of Univision Communications, and he currently serves on Univision's board of directors. He served as president of the National League of Cities, as deputy chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, He's currently an officer for Habitat for Humanity International, and he's done many other things in many different ways. I, I want to mention in particularly one of the books that he was co-author of, uh, a book with co-authored with Jack Kemp, Opportunity and Progress, a Bipartisan Platform for National Housing Policy, which won the Common Purpose Award for demonstrating the potential of bipartisan cooperation. And now hold your applause as I introduce the other member of the panel and who will be tonight's moderator, USC uh, Price Professor Dr. David Sloan. Uh, I've come to admire David greatly in the five years, four years since I've known him and seen him in action. Uh, he is really uh, an expert and prominent scholar of American urban history, urban planning, public policy, and community and health planning. He's the former director of the Saul Price Urban Planning Graduate Programs, recently directing their undergraduate program, which is the largest in the school. Under his leadership, the undergraduate cu curriculum was greatly revised and improved, uh, and he is really a fantastic uh, man as well. Uh, so he's the liaison to the Washington Library, and he's been helping us out. And let's give a big welcome to uh, Henry Cisneros and David Sloan. Dr. Bradburn, thank you very much for your 
kind words of introduction for the invitation to be here and for the wonderful job you're doing at this library. It is true, as Dr. Bradburn said, that I was interviewed for the Vice Presidency in 1984, so I'll take you back to just a moment of ancient history. <laughs> the other persons who were interviewed on that occasion by Walter Mondale were Senator Benson of Texas, uh, Mike Dukakis, who was governor of Massachusetts, Wilson Good, who was the mayor of Philadelphia, and Diane Feinstein, who was then uh, mayor of San Francisco. So I don't think I came that close because there were five of us <laughs> <laughs> who were interviewed, although it was the 4th of July of 1984, a very special day for my family and for my city because I went home that evening after the interview in North Oaks, Minnesota to a 4th of J uh, July celebration full of fireworks and I felt that maybe they were for that occasion. But <laughs> in any event, none of the five were selected. One of the great relief moments of my life is when I got the call from Walter Mondale to tell me that he had selected Geraldine Ferraro, someone completely different. Uh, and that was a very difficult race for the two of them. <laughs> something, something that I was able to duck. Uh, but thank you so much for your good work uh, and what a magnificent place this is. Mrs. Colson and the Regents of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, congratulations on your magnificent contribution to our country. Uh, this is testament to the fact that if you want to get something truly outstanding done, you get 27 outstanding women <laughs> to do it. <laughs> to Mrs. Mary Beth Borthnick, who is a person who endowed this uh, event. Thank you very much. And Jack Knott, a dear friend of mine, who you have heard introduced as the Dean of the Price School of Public Policy at uh, the University of Southern California, a, a, a really important institution growing in significance in our country. I've admired Jack and his accomplishments for a long time. Tonight, I discovered he has one more commonality with George Washington, and that is he is tall. <laughs> for, our, for his time. Um, I, I would like to uh, once again thank the ladies of the Mount Vernon uh, uh, Ladies Association for this magnificent uh, preservation of this site, one of the most important historic sites in our country. Wonderful work. Also to recognize the work of the University of Southern California and its continued emergence as uh, a premier elite educational institution. Wall Street Journal recently ranking the best institutions in the country, educational institutions ranked USC 15th in the country. So breaking that top 20 elite, which takes years and years to do, very impressive. And the School of Public Policy, the Price School, which Dean Knott heads, is ranked fourth among the schools of public policy, right there with the Kennedy School and the Maxwell School at Syracuse and the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton is this institution on the West Coast at the University of Southern California. So congratulations, Jack, on and, and to USC. I've had the good fortune of a number of associations with USC, uh, including serving on Jack's board at the Price School, and it is uh, an honor and a privilege. Um, one other connection, if I may uh, make to uh, George Washington, uh, is that my doctorate is from George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. I came here in 1970, the winter of 1970, and started working at the National League of Cities and um, did my, my doctoral work at George Washington that year. It was a tumultuous time in Washington during the heart of the Vietnam War protests and some continuation of the civil war, civil rights protests, uh, but it was a wonderful experience to work on cities' issues at the same time I was studying them as a doctoral student at George Washington, a university that has a collaboration with USC in hosting students here, and a university that makes it possible for people to work in a city like Washington and get an advanced degree. Uh, and of course, it introduced me to the life and times of President Washington, um, which I've had the t opportunity to study over the years and, and, and really have come to admire his leadership. He was called then the father of our country as he lived, and that title has not been diminished with time. 
generally we see ebb and flows in the reputation of great figures over time, but not George Washington. He remains the father of our country and is beloved. As Representative Henry Lee said, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Our nation is blessed that at the moment of its formation, at critical decisions, both in times of war, when he was the head of the Continental Army, and later critical moments in the Constitutional Convention and in his presidency, George Washington was the person in position, recognized by his uh, counterparts, his colleagues of that era, as the superior human being. What a blessing for our country that that was the case. His leadership formation uh, it occurred over an entire lifetime. And if you look at critical points along his personal history, one finds evidences of this leadership in formation. From an early life, after the death of his father, who had been the justice of Westmoreland County Court, and then his, his half-brother Lawrence, it was clear that he had public responsibilities, public expectations of him from early in life. At age 17, he became a surveyor that took him to Western Virginia and the Ohio Territory, and there he began to see the possibilities and frame a personal vision of the future of this land, uh, an aspirational sense that never left his leadership. He fought frontier battles in the war of uh, the French and Indian War, and though he suffered setbacks in combat experiences, uh, many later regard his tactical decisions at later points as attributable to experiences he had that early on as a young soldier, as a young officer in the French and Indian Wars. He returned to life as a planter and was recruited for Virginia political responsibilities and also military responsibilities, but also relished his role as a planter and growing the estate that would become Mount Vernon. And it's during that period that he grew in empathy for colonial life, for commerce in the colonies, for the spirit of enterprise, and came to understand the way real people wor lived and worked in the colonies as a, as a leader. And it was during that period that he became influential in the principles of the early rebellion, the intolerable acts of, of 1774. He spoke up and called them an invasion of rights and privileges, not a position that many wealthy landowners of that period took, conflicted as they were between loyalties to the crown and an understanding of life in the colonies, but not George Washington. He not only took a principled position and became a delegate to the first Virginia Convention and then a delegate to the Continental Congress, but famously, to the Second Continental Congress Assembly wore his military uniform to signify that things were changing and it was going to be necessary to put together a military force and he was ready to participate and prepared to lead. So it was very clear in those early stages that he was a formative influence in the thinking about what might actually occur. It was logical that the leaders of the American forces would uh, asked him to be commander of the American Continental Forces. And there he assumed major responsibilities for tactical decisions, some setbacks in battles, for example, in the New York area, the winter at Valley Forge, which was formative for him and for the nation, and then the tactical decisions that led to the final victory at Yorktown. So he was a tactical leader, renowned for his discipline in training that organized an army with help, but also was the embodiment of the resistance. If it was one person who in his person embodied the resistance, the unwillingness to quit through that winter at Valley Forge, it was George Washington. So he handled the, the, the stresses of command, uh, the shortages of resources, and kept the army and the nation, the, the emergent nation, motivated at all that time. It was logical then that he would be called after the war to become president of the Constitutional Convention, where he evidenced a vision for what 
the framework of governance for the new nation might be, vision. And as he became president and served two terms, and by the way, no subsequent president, no successor, has gotten a unanimous vote from the Electoral Congress since uh, George Washington. Uh, but it once again showed the balance of temperament and wisdom that we've come to recognize in this man. Well, I've described a series of traits, traits that one might call universal traits, eternal traits of leadership. As long as we've had people gathering for common purposes, we have to have someone who emerges to lead. From biblical times, leaders like Moses. In the Greek period, leaders like Pericles. In Roman, Caesar Augu in Roman period, Re Caesar Augustus and his opponent, uh, the Carthaginian general Hannibal. In the Middle Ages, great and renowned figures like Charlemagne embody some of the traits that I've tried to describe as formed in George Washington over the years. Strength of character, a sense of being stalwart and resolute, of physical stamina despite overcoming smallpox early in life and having some uh, ailments and pains later, of physical stamina to withstand the stresses not only of the war but then later eight years of, of rigorous service, a sense of clear principles matched to an expansive vision gave him, as I said a moment ago, a sense of the aspirational, a framework for a new nation. Imagine that, framing a new nation from something that had no precedent, didn't exist before. Uh, a sense of tactical competence. People respected his proficiency in war decisions as well as his understanding of the formation of a government. He put himself through personal sacrifice that winter in Valley Forge. Something over 2,000 of his troops died of a mixture of hunger and cold. Great, immense personal sacrifice as he never left the field, stayed with them through that period, and as I say, was the embodiment of the rebellion. He had a sense of confidence, balanced temperament with good judgment and wisdom, with a spiritual basis for it, not something that he frequently talked about because he believed so deeply in separation of church and state, but a sense of clear spirituality that guided his decision and in the final analysis was ultimately reliable. His word was his bond, his commitments were true, he was the indispensable man in American history. It's interesting when one looks at these sort of eternal characteristics or as I, as I said, universal characteristics of leadership, that we see them over the ages. Leadership has some fixed qualities. Yes, it is responsive to the times. And if we did a quick analysis of other presidents, we would find leadership traits that some had greater degrees than others, but that responded to the realities of the time. That will be true in our time as well. But let me digress for just a moment and describe some of the leadership traits that we saw from other presidents that related to the challenges of their moment. Thomas Jefferson and lived in a period of westward opportunity, westward expansion. He's the person of the Louisiana Purchase. So he brought the creative vision that characterized much of his life to the business of expanding the country. President Lincoln, in the lead up to the Civil War, the divisions of slavery, and then managing a bloody war, the bloodiest experience in American history, showed almost superhuman determination to hold a country together. <coughs> President Theodore Roosevelt, who managed the adjustment to industrialization, the first major economic transformation in the country from an agrarian society to an industrial society with all of the massive implications in the cities, in the labor unions, in the industrial uh, 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 groupings, um, brought courage to take on the elites and change the economic order, foresaw the kinds of changes and regulation and role of government that would be required.
President Wilson, who was drawn into the war to end all wars, as was described of World War I, so horrible, but pe people couldn't imagine we could ever, as a globe, as a world, go through this again, uh, emerged with a sense of vision of how to create a global structure for peace in his efforts to create the League of Nations. Franklin Roosevelt, who inherited a depression and then managed World War II, uh, was a man of action, of mobilization, of explaining to the country, but his leadership gift was to be able to inspire confidence, whether it was that the country would survive the <coughs> depression, uh, nothing to fear but fear itself, or World War II, uh, speaking to the nation the morning after, the day after Pearl Harbor. President Eisenhower, uh, who, 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 who inherited the modern American role in the world and forged uh, a, a peace through the 1950s, again, a figure who inspired confidence, confidence and pride in being an American, uh, the ultimate manager of our forces in World War II, the landing at Normandy on D-Day, and then President of the United States in a time of, of great change. President Kennedy brought a new level of energy, what one might call generational passage, the first of his generation to become president, and his leadership gift involved inspiration, inspiring the country to undergo this generational change. President Johnson, uh, who was motivated by uh, readings of The Other America, uh, Harrington's book of the era that described poverty uh, that few Americans recognized still existed at that level, but Lyndon Johnson knew it did because he lived it in Texas and, of course, had a sense of moral imperative about civil rights, uh, brought uh, a leadership gift of competence competence in managing legislation and managing the Congress and produced nation-changing legislation as a result. President Reagan, who oversaw and had a vision of a recalibration of government to be of smaller scale and lesser role in the lesser levels of intrusion in the society, again inspired a sense of confidence in the nation at, 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 at large that there was a responsible person a person of vision at the, at the till. I served with President Clinton, whose, whose uh, it fell to him to manage the passage to a new century. He coined the concept of building a bridge to the 21st century and harnessing the prosperity that some early decisions created in his administration to create a long-lasting recovery that then could be translated into some programs that would help people at the margins of the society. His gift was to be able to explain and build support through his capacity to explain. The two President Bushes both inherited uh, war situations. Saddam Hussein's in incursion into Kuwait required a response, which President H.W. Bush responded to, and of course the events of 9-11 prompted President George W. Bush to initiate a response. Both were uh, capable of unifying the country around their explanation of the imperative to act on these circumstances, these emergencies that confronted them. And President Obama inherited the Great Recession and was able to, again, explain the nature of the response that was necessary in very, very difficult times and, and, and nurse the country back to some level of economic stability. President Trump has yet to confront the kinds of leadership challenges that have confronted other presidents, and we will see in due course how he rises to bring his gifts of leadership to the circumstances we confront. But my point is that in every era, the George Washington eternal values of leadership, the George Washington sense of universal values are applicable. So the question then becomes, well, what of our time? What are the characteristics of our times that are, going to, that are going to require not just presidential leadership, but leadership more broadly? I think this is a very difficult time because just as every president has had 
a new era to confront. I mentioned President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, and the transformation from an agrarian to industrial society. Others have been confronted with war attacks or economic setbacks. But it's very difficult when the very foundations of the society are in movement, when the tectonic sh plates are shifting. Let me just describe to you uh, my sense of a couple of things that are happening in the society and see whether they, uh, whether you agree that these are the kinds of things that are, that are moving. Our country is very di divided, divided by the news that we see and the, the, the way we watch it, completely different if one watches Fox News versus MSNBC and we're all uh, guided to the news that we want to watch and we're chopped up into blocks uh, by uh, computers that, 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 that look at our <coughs> buying habits and our consumer habits and, and uh, put us into, s into segments. Um, we're segregated by housing. We're segregated by our religious beliefs. Some have said the most segregated hour in America is 11 o'clock on Sunday. <coughs> uh, and uh, so clearly one dimension of the American moment is that we're, we're very divided, and not just Democrats and Republicans, liberals and conservatives, but increasingly a kind of atomized society in which people can get information for themselves, process it, and come to a thousand different <coughs> conclusions with different interpretations of facts, which makes this, I think, a more challenging time than others. <coughs> just because of the nature of the atomized information we receive. We have an increasingly short attention span, usually no longer than the news cycle. It's frustrating to see a situation like what occurred in Puerto Rico and was covered intensively for an entire week, displaced, of course, by a domestic <coughs> event, the events in, in Las Vegas. And it's almost as if Puerto Rico no longer exists because we've moved on to the next dramatic subject that captures our attention. Um, the video game mentality, the reality show mentality has made our attention span very short, hard to focus, hard to reflect. The speed of life has accelerated uh, to, thanks to communications technologies. I uh, have been in business or government in leadership positions for a long time. And frankly, I can't keep up with the speed of texts, emails, and other communications that require instantaneous decisions. And at the e end of the day, I have to ask myself, did I really hear that? Did I really decide that? What answer did I give? Because there's so many things over the course of the day to try to, to remember. It's almost disoriented. It's almost as if it's exceeded the capacity of our normal mental processes to keep up with the, <coughs> the, 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 the communications. Add to that a sense of that, that, that I'm going to have a difficult time describing, but I know it when I see it, and that is the replacement with a kind of rational calculation as opposed to principles, but a sense of that we can apply economic rationality somehow that's taught in our business schools and, and taught increasingly in, in every school, not just business or engineering uh, uh, or law school, but applied to almost every facet of life, a kind of economic rationality that breeds a kind of cynicism and with it increasing division because we make harsher calculations about people and their motives and it breeds a kind of coarsening of our dialogue. I, I, I can't, I don't know to what exactly it is attributable, but it's virtually it's very clear to me that we talk to each other in different ways. We don't believe each other quite in the way that we did before, and respect for one another has declined in the process. Add on top of that, economic forces, global realities, and inequalities within our system, uh, international insecurities and threats, which are very, very real, and it's no doubt that there is increased fear and anxieties and anger and a tendency to sort of pull into our own families and our own interests, lock the doors, and, uh, and reduce the level of interaction people to people. The diversity of our population <coughs> is increasing, and with that,
that diversity comes a sense of loyalties to our own group, uh, different perspectives, and, all, and you put all that into a mix, and it is a very different society. Now, it is not my intent to be partisan. I'm not going to – I'm going to studiously avoid being partisan this evening. Um, but I will say that some of the things that I've seen from the present administration are not helpful when they're put into the mix with this situation. Now, let me just say, I don't blame Donald Trump because my sense is we knew what, who Donald Trump was when we elected him. He, he didn't change over all these years of watching him. We knew what we were getting. So what's really changed is our view of who we want to be president. It is the American people who have changed in ways that I've just described. We are a different place these days as a country. Donald Trump didn't create that difference. He was able to ride the crest of that difference, but he didn't create it. We have fundamentally changed, our society has changed, and it's something we need to think deeply about because many of these changes make it very difficult to govern the polity of America. Very difficult to find uh, common ground on, on uh, basic principles and, and, and basic ideas that have always been part of the American process of bipartisanship, of due process of law, of, of respect for a civil discourse and civil dialogue, of respect for some level of facts and science uh, if, if, if we're changing the ground rules such that those things don't matter anymore, then we're in for a very, very rough ride. This is the way that great nations, truly great nations, nations that seem indomitable, that there's no end to their, their, their duration on the scene of national leadership, international leadership, begin to decline. When, when not the leader, but the people themselves allow themselves to change in these fundamental ways. So let me come back to leadership and eventually George Washington. What is the kind of leadership then that we require for our times? One of the things I've observed over the years is that leaders can make a real difference. When the leader states a set of principles, directions, sets the tone, it actually moves the needle. People relate, relate to that in one way or another, negatively when inspired that way or positively when the sights are raised. What we need in leadership at the moment is exactly the antidote to the kinds of divisions that I have been describing, if we can find it. What are the elements? Well, first, I suspect that we need leadership that can explain complexity explain the complex elements of what we're going through and has the gift, such as President Reagan did, such as President Clinton did, such as President Roosevelt did, to take a complex situation, an unpleasant situation, break it down into its functional parts and help us sort it out, help us untangle it, help us disaggregate the complexity. That requires being truthful, not trying to shape the facts to a political objective, and it requires slowing down, being more uh, deliberative and more encouraging reflection on the part of the American people. It requires what Dr. King said we should do, which is talk to people as if they're intelligent. He didn't change his rhetoric and dialogue to suit his audience. He spoke at the levels of his doctorate from Boston University to every audience, and people were complimented by it and listened to him. And, 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 and we're able to absorb complex, nuanced subjects. So that strikes me as one aspect of the kind of leadership that we need today. A second is to be skilled in the ways of searching for and finding the common ground. I served as mayor, I served as a city council member before I was mayor with a first woman mayor of a major American city. Her name was Lila Cockrell, and I was just I, I just was in, in awe of her ability to find a sliver of daylight in even the darkest political situation. 
uh, we would suffer a defeat on a Thursday evening council meeting and Friday morning she was spry and whistling and, and, and optimistic and able to find that there was just a sense that somewhere in this darkness there is a sliver of daylight. We're going to find it and we're going to expand that and build on that. Uh, and she was looking for the common ground. You have to listen carefully to people to do that. We need leaders who will listen and bring a sense of optimism and bring a sense of respect for the institutions and history and due process of law. We can't denigrate our institutions and then in expect them to function for us, expect people to observe and follow those procedures if we denigrate them uh, institutionally all of the time. Uh, again, leadership can make a difference. Leadership can, can change how people think of these things. A third element that I would say we need in leadership for these times is respect for people. There is a gift that some people have, some political leaders have, which is a truly meaningful admiration and respect for the life stories of other people. Now that's a difficult thing to do in big league politics because you have to deal with so many people that it's almost a wholesale relationship, not a retail relationship, because you are dealing with people as large numbers in a voting sheet or on a telephone phone bank or some other thing that dehumanizes instead of really understanding individuals have human stories and everybody has a story and it's worth respecting and it's worth learning from. So respecting people, a sense of empathy, what President Lincoln uh, encourages us to do is to seek the better angels of our own nature, but one might also say the better angels in everyone's nature. That is a political gift. And as Dr. King said, we seek the kind of arc of progress of humanity, which he said the arc of progress bends toward justice. It bends toward the better things for our society. The arc of progress bends in the direction of human progression. And if we believe that, we can, we can, we can, we can bring a sense of optimism to the business of political life. It starts with truly respecting people. Hard thing to do when we're exhausted, when we're seeing people in the, in the hundreds as political leaders must do, but I think very important dimension of leadership. The next point I would make is <coughs> that it's important to have humility about the limits of a person, that is to say the leader. The leader has to have a sense of humility about just exactly what they did. Because generally speaking, they're the product of a lot of other people's work. And generally speaking, the product of a whole complex set of forces that sometimes are no more than chance that provides a person success. So it's important to have a sense of humility, as clearly George Washington did, about himself. He couldn't have made the decision not to seek a third term, but for a sense of humility that he personally was not going to make himself essential, either as a third term president or even a monarch, as some were suggesting, because he thought the country itself, the processes and other human beings were, were, were important in the process. Hugely important to put things in perspective and have a sense of, 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 of reasonable humanity, even through all of the sense of the bubble and the isolation that comes with modern American politics. Finally, I would say in terms of these attributes of leadership, you have to find individuals who bring personal energy and stamina because this is grinding work. All of the things that I've described will wear you down. So it's interesting to find people who uh, are re-inspired, are refreshed by the beautiful things they see, whether it's a sense of the country and its majesty or whether it's a sense of some moment uh, when a president is playing the role of, um, of, of, of chief mourner for the nation, interpreting the pain of a moment like I have seen with my own eyes, Presidents Reagan, President Clinton do after the Oklahoma City bombing, President Bush do numerous times after 9-11. But to be re-energized, to be refreshed in a way to, for the job ahead by the sense of being moved 
by, by the grandeur and the greatness of the nation and the goodness of its people at a sincere and deep level. So those sound very different as traits than the, the, the combination of, of conflicting forces that are tearing our country apart today. But we have to believe in them. As I said, it's my sense that these are sort of enduring principles. They, they existed for George Washington. Many of the things that I've described, I think you could say, existed in George Washington, would have to be updated for the present time. But leadership is not to be just a reflection of its time, but in major ways ought to be a response to the times to try to steer us back in the direction of some eternal verities and some truths that hold us together. And that's just some thoughts on, on, uh, that, I, that I've assembled for this evening on how we can draw from that great leader, George Washington, and bring his thoughts and values to shape our country today. Let me just close my remarks in the same way that uh, Professor Bradburn did um, by, by quoting some historians about the Washington presidency and the Washington farewell address. Because I think they, 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 some of these sort of echo the kinds of things that we're living with today. Here's what was written by a, a combination of various historians. Washington proved an able administrator and established many precedents in the functions of the presidency, including messages to Congress and the cabinet form of government. He set the standard for tolerance of opposition voices, despite fears that a democratic system would lead to political violence, and he conducted a smooth transition of power to his successor. He was an excellent delegator and judge of talent and character. He talked regularly with department heads and listened to their advice before making a final decision. In handling routine tasks, he was systematic, orderly, energetic, solicitous of the opinion of others, but decisive, intent upon general goals and the consistency of particular, particular actions with them. After reluctantly serving a second term, Washington refused to run for a third, establishing the, tra the tradition of a maximum of two-year terms for a president, which was solidified by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Now that's an analysis of his presidency. Quickly, some final thoughts on his farewell address. Quote, it gives advice on the necessity, importance, and importance of national union, the value of the Constitution, and the rule of law, the evils of political parties, and the proper virtues of a Republican people. He referred to morality as a necessary spring of popular government. The address warned against foreign influence in domestic affairs, American meddling in European affairs, and bitter partisanship in domestic politics. He called for men to move beyond partisanship and serve the common good. George Washington, at the end of his presidency, is as relevant then as he would be today. Eternal qualities of leadership that apply in our divided times. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. Good evening. My name is David Sloan, as you've heard. I'm a professor in the Saul Price School of Public Policy. I'm going to spend a few minutes with uh, Secretary Cisneros talking about some questions. And then we're going to take questions from the audience. Because of the, the structure of this room, normally we would have a mic. But in this case, we're going to ask that there's people somewhere over here uh, and over there who have note cards. And if you would uh, write out your question on a note card as legibly as possible, uh, we're going to ask uh, Director Bradburn to give us a little bit of vetting, and then we're going to try and take some of your questions as we go ahead. OK? Uh, does that make sense, I hope? The, the postcards are around uh, for you to pick, and I'm sure they probably have pencils as well. And if you don't, I have a pen right here. Um, I almost started, I, I, I was very tempted to start by saying, you know, excuse me, I got I to do a text. 
Um, but <laughs> I decided that would be a little hokey. And so, but I do want to talk, I, I want to go first to this litany. Because it's a big litany. It's a significant shift, a tectonic shift, as you suggest. And I, let's talk about it in two terms. What is it doing to American society? And then how, I, mean, I love your, your, your set of leadership characteristics, but how can we imagine that that group of people to be leaders with those characteristics are going to emerge in the middle of this, this shift? Particularly, you know, I'm a college professor, and uh, it turns out that my students who are uh, uh, quite a bit younger than I am, have to get up every 20 minutes to go to the restroom. But of course, they're not going to the restroom. They're going to check their phones, because they can't do it out of my classroom. And there is, it is this attention disorder, if you will. How do we get to the people who can do the respect? Well, there's a lot of white uh, young men uh, uh, and, and students. Yeah, yeah. Now. Testing one, two, three. There it yeah, is. Yeah, there we okay. go. Okay. Uh, a lot of writing. Pre uh, uh, Professor Bradburn has been uh, writing on subjects of citizenship and engagement and involvement, and uh, Bob Putman at at, uh, at Harvard and a number of others on what the technology and the things I described the forces I described are doing to our sense of engagement, our sense of uh, relating to one another. Uh, it's very possible for people to be in their office buildings and be around people just like themselves, who think just like them, and get in the car and listen to the radio station that they want to in their rolled up with their rolled up windows and air conditioning and drive into the remote controlled um, uh, garage and go into the house and watch only the programs with the opinions that they like and never, ever be exposed to other people. Um, uh, and certainly with the decline in involvement in organizations, whether they be school organizations or church organizations or children's sports organizations, et cetera, uh, even, even less likelihood of people engaging with other people. There's something important, I think, in the human spirit about just engaging with others, listening to, uh, truly listening to, to others. And when we lose that, I think we, 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 we change as a society. So I think these are real things that we need to worry about. Um, can, a le can leaders emerge to counter that? Well, as I said earlier, um, it, it would be a mistake if we chose only leaders who reinforce those trends. In some sense, the people uh, will instinctively look to leadership that can sort of correct places where the needle has gone too far. And I think if we can find people who speak to us in truthful ways and, and, and help us find uh, a sense of the common ground that maybe isn't our exact position, but that, that seems fair, um, and explain, really explain these complexities, uh, I think there is room in American politics for, for those attributes and that kind of leader. Um, and I, I, I almost believe we're going to get it because uh, people instinctively know when things have gone too far. And, and, and time and again in American life, we correct. We correct. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I have a sense that the next elections, both 18 and, and 20, will have a large dimension of that. So uh, Dean Knott alluded to uh, this extraordinary thing that George Washington did uh, in the middle of his administration, where he took these trips uh, from New Hampshire to Georgia, yeah. putting his own health at great peril uh, to introduce the American people to the idea of the American president, to the idea of the nation. And uh, you know, there's a really great book about this by T.H. Brin. Uh, recently published, and it's a, it's a great read, and I encourage you to look for it if you haven't. 
But the thing I was struck by was, in some sense, what the president was trying to do, President Washington was trying to do, was establish some sort of interactive civil discourse. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, do you have suggestions for how we, in this moment of you know, change, how we, I know this is a big issue for you, an important issue for you. What are the avenues for us to think about reasserting our civil discourse? And I, and I, I want to be clear here, I, I mean, in some sense, a civic discourse as, as much as any kind of civility. I'm not, ma again, I'm not making any partisan uh, comments. Well, first of all, um, it's obviously very important for public leaders to meet with the public as best they can. But we're a big country of 320 million people, so it's just not possible to get in front personally of 320 million people. But in some sense, our modern methods of communication, especially good uh, publicly oriented television, make it possible for people to get a real sense of who their leaders are and what the choices they're confronting are and what the real character of these people are. Um, it's very hard to, to, to hide much anymore about who a person really is. And I mean, at multiple levels of peeling back the onion, you can get a real sense of the core of a person. And uh, so working hard to, to uh, present before the public and share those kinds of differences is, is, is I think, important and something we need to respect and encourage in every way, by every m method of television and every form of debate and every kind of town hall meeting that we can create. Um, but the public needs to be attentive and paying attention to that. One of the things I find fascinating about your career is that in virtually every office that you've held and every position you've held, every company you've held, you've tried to create top-down and grassroots. Uh, both sides creating change in some sort of complementary fashion. And um, I guess the other part of leadership that we didn't talk, we haven't talked as much about, is how do we ensure that our ordinary citizen, our ordinary member of our communities, ordinary members of our institutions are also leaders? And not everybody can be George Washington, mm -hmm. but in some sense, for us to get through this. Well, I think it's very important, and I've said listen carefully several times tonight, but I think it's important to listen to where, where people are going with respect to um, what they want in terms of progress and, and direction. Um, and the leader who can articulate that sort of common sense of the future um, has the best chance to communicate with them. And then involving people in the process is important. Now this, what I'm about to describe to you, happens at the local level. It can't be an answer to national solutions. But uh, I was 33 years old, uh, first Hispanic elected mayor of my city since 1836, the fall of the Alamo. Uh, and uh, I was a university professor. Uh, unlike the tradition of electing mayors who were chairman of the Chamber of Commerce and established business leaders. So I had a lot to prove. And one of the things I did was decided to take a page from a mayor from Dallas in the 1960s named Eric Johnson, who put forward a, a program he called Goals for Dallas. And it's what identified the need for what is now DFW Airport and has changed the whole identity and future of North Texas. Um, so I put a program together and we called it, this was 1983, we called it Target 90. Where do we want to be in 1990? What things would, do we prioritize and want to accomplish together? Now I'm a very kind of rational, goal-oriented person, so I thought the primary benefit of going through that process was going to be to identify the things that people wanted to do. It turned out that we established task forces of about 30 people or so for each of 12 action areas. And then other people came to join the process. So we ended up with literally about 600 people involved in the goal setting process. What I didn't appreciate 
was the reach that 600 people had. What I didn't appreciate was the reach later when we tried to do tax increases or bond issues to enact some of these things. And by the way, in the intervening years, something like 120 out of 144 goals that they set have actually been accomplished for the city. What I didn't appreciate then was that the real benefit would be having 600 people totally bought in and engaged in the process and becoming apostles, if you will, for those ideas. So I became, it quickly, I quickly understood the importance of finding ways to give people a voice, create inclusive settings, respect their opinions, be willing to sacrifice some things that you think you want in return for what they say they actually want, listen carefully. I think those are, at least at the local level, that proved to me the way one can govern. And it proved to be a very successful endeavor, not only in terms of the traditional measures, getting reelected and that sort of thing, but, but, but taking these, these projects, getting them accomplished. More importantly, San Antonio now has had about a 30-year consensus of essentially a mainstream direction of progress. No matter who's the mayor, no matter who, what ethnic group is in the ascendancy at a given moment, reducing the temperature of disagreement and Im improving the sense of consensus that we're headed in a common direction. So you travel a lot. I do. And have gone many, many places. And one of the things I've always believed as a historian is that much of the change that, begin that ends up in Washington begins in San Antonio or in Jacksonville or in Indianapolis or in Los Angeles. And I was, so again, talking about leadership here, in some sense what you just described is a city that has generations of leaders mm -hmm. who are working through processes. Mm -hmm. As you travel, do you see this at a local level? I see it more and more. And I think that the uh, movement toward uh, 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 local initiative is more pronounced in our country for the reasons that I've described. Uh, people are making decisions for themselves. They have more information for themselves. Th there's a sense that we're living in an era when many things that happen that are important in our lives are happening in the communities around us. Uh, Bruce Katz, who was my chief of staff in the years that I was at HUD and now is at the Brookings Institution, has written a book in which he describes America as a metropolitan nation. We are, without a doubt, a metropolitan nation. 65% of the American people live in just the 100 largest metro areas out of thousands. Just the largest 100 is 65% of our people. They generate 75% of the nation's GDP. And they generate 78% of the research and innovation, patents and other measures of innovation. So the truth of the matter is there's an awful lot of smart people and an awful lot of energy out in these engines of our national economy and our national future, which are our cities, metropolitan areas, and communities. Good things are being done in Seattle and in Portland and in San Francisco and in Denver and in uh, Atlanta and, and, and in the heartland of the country, in Des Moines and, and uh, uh, Omaha and, 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 and thousands of other places. Now, that's not to excuse Washington for its stalemates and failures, because no matter what we can do at the local level, we still need someone to get the budget deficit uh, down, to deal with the realities of the shortfall in Social Security, to deal with questions of life and death and national security, which only the national government can do. So it, it, it cannot be excused for, making, for putting itself on the sidelines. But I suspect there's things that we've thought about as national principles that we're going to have to engage state and local governments in doing that we haven't before. For example, we're having a national debate about inequality. And it is clear that in some senses, America is becoming more unequal. Today, African Americans and Latinos have as a percentage of wealth, that is to say, compared to the average American family, one-tenth, 10% of the net worth or earnings or wealth 
as the traditional American family. They earn 70% in income. That's not good. 70% uh, is substantially less. But income is what goes in and out every month. Wealth is what you amass, net worth. There, the numbers are 10%, not 70%. 10%. So there's no, no, no question but that we're, 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 we're embarking in some very difficult ground here. Uh, the federal government is not a positive factor in addressing the question of inequality today. It's stalemated. It's got budget deficits. It's not playing the role that it did, either since the Depression or from the great society forward. State governments, not particularly innovative on this front. They have important responsibilities for health care, for education, for higher education. But here we have cities all over America and, and metro areas that are prospering. They're doing well. The new economy favors them. International trade, business and professional services, new media, great medical centers, great higher education institutions. They're all thriving. And can we, can we figure out how to tap that urban renaissance and, and, and help it address the question of inequality by being more precise about how we create jobs, entrepreneurship, small businesses, and, 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 and address some of these questions. I think we can. I think it's time we had that discussion as a country. But again, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, forgive uh, or excuse the federal government's uh, ineptness on its responsibilities, which we need to have engaged as well. So thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm going to play with them because we have way too many to read them literally. Uh, so we're going to take the first two, um, Barbara and Steve, I'm going to sort of join together. And that is the role of our educational institutions in the current moment. Mm -hmm. And essentially, to both sides, how do you grade our e educational institutions on instilling the values that you talked about? And two, do you believe that the most important leaders in our society our parents and teachers who are capable of instilling the character and discipline that you talked about. I do believe the most important leaders in our educational system are parents, engaged parents, and teachers who can do that most difficult thing. One of the most difficult things in the human experience is being able to take knowledge from one brain and convey it energetically to another human being. Complex knowledge and science and mathematics and, and, and social virtues and many other things. So yes, I do believe that parents are, are absolutely critical to the process of education uh, and, uh, and teachers. Uh, and with respect to parents, I would say, uh, very important to persuade minority parents, some of whom are overworked, disheartened, uh, frustrated, uh, maybe come from a foreign country where education isn't quite valued the same way or understood for its significance and help them understand their role in the American educational system. Do, are we doing enough in the schools to foster a sense of civic virtues and civic values? No, I don't think we are. I think we need to uh, spend more time with students in uh, 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 social service activities, volunteer activities, uh, required uh, college courses in service, Leadership development, uh, where, where the, it actually college credit for uh, involved in student leadership activities that put people in connection with other people and put them in charge and test their leadership skills early in life. Um, there's a lot of, of programs of that nature across the country. I, th I think they're a good idea. Um, and uh, I am frustrated frequently when I'm on college campuses and, and um, I, I, it, it, it leaves one concerned about uh, just how knowledgeable about civic life, understanding of their responsibilities in it, uh, generation of a sense of caring. Uh, all of these are important things that need, to be, that need to be fostered. So earlier we had dinner with those amazing USC students who we love. That's a select group. Uh, not only are they USC, but uh, they are young people who have chosen uh, public policy careers. And They're so here as part of a school of public policy and uh, have already made decisions that somehow they want to be engaged in making the world better. Uh, and 
I know you would like to meet them. May I ask those students who are here from USC for the next for the last few days to stand and be recognized. These are master's level students in public stand policy. Up. University of They're around. There's a couple up there. They're down here. So Anastasia asks, how do we encourage more of our youth from, ver from diverse and challenging backgrounds to enter public service? Well, it's not necessary that they enter public service because it just isn't reasonable to expect that everyone is going to be in public service. But it is important to ask them to connect in the society. People can be bankers or business leaders or uh, private equity moguls, so long as they are understanding that the society can't work with their, without their involvement. That we need not, 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 not their money, but their personal involvement. Uh, some time uh, guiding someone, mentoring someone, sharing uh, advice with someone. Um, so I, I, I frequently speak to, to college groups, including uh, from business and other sectors. And m my strong admonition at the conclusion of my remarks is that they find a way to engage and be leaders in the society. We, we, it doesn't matter the form of leadership, church leadership, uh, scouting, uh, boys clubs, YMCA, uh, little League, uh, whatever it is, neighborhood association. We need, we need two things. People who can, bringing positive values and trying to make the world better generally. And secondly, there is a magic in people associating with people. It's, we're, 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 we're social creatures at our core. John Nesbitt, a few years ago, when he wrote his book Megatrends, described a whole series of big shifts in the society, big megatrends. And one of them was, obviously, high tech. This is 20 years ago, and it was still uh, new to be describing this phenomenon. But he, in the next of his megatrends, after high tech, he described high touch. How we as human beings, being the kinds of creatures that we are, cannot function just as rational computers, but, but have to relate to other people. And there's a two plus two effect that happens for the society when people engage that way. I believe that to be true. From everything I have seen, I believe that to be true. And even when I'm exhausted and I don't want to see one more person uh, for that day, um, I um, am amazed when I see the effect of, of, of people engaging with people and, and, and how necessary it is in, in the human experience. And I can, as having spent much of the couple, few, many hours with the <laughs> secretary today, I can speak to his generosity and trying to connect with people. It's really quite lovely to watch. And if you have an opportunity, uh, the eulogy that he uh, gave for his mother mm. in 2014 is online and pretty easy to get. And he talks about, uh, he has this, this gorgeous paragraph where he talks about you know, you never wanted to go shopping with mom because you never got out of anywhere without her talking to everybody in the place. <laughs> and I got to tell you, having walked around with him today, he got a fair touch of this. <laughs> we have a neighborhood grocery store. The, the, the biggest grocer in San Antonio is called HEB. They're, they're, they're renowned for their, their quality and so forth. They, they build in all of the neighborhoods of San Antonio. My mom lived in a, um, a lower income Latino neighborhood. And when they decided to build a new store, they built it, they bought more ground, built the new store, kept the old one open, and then eventually closed the older one. But they made the mistake of telling her that she was going to be on the advisory committee for the transition process, which led her to believe that that was her store. <laughs> so <laughs> when, I, when she asked me to pick her up at 1 o'clock on a Saturday to take her to grocery shopping, I had the good sense to drop her off, not stay with her. Because I knew she would say, pick me up at 2.30. That's an hour and a half from now to pick up a few items. Because she would go and talk to every, <laughs> every clerk and every, every uh, person working in the storehouse and the little old lady who needed some help and the young single mom who needed some assistance. It was her store. And that was, that was just my mom. <laughs> That's a lovely story. All right, let's talk a little politics. We have a couple of, uh, we have three or four 
question. We're going to run out of time here, but uh, and I want there's one personal one I want to get to, but quickly, is our electoral process, our election process, capable of getting us through this term, and special interests, uh, you know, money, the disparities that you talked about, is it going to be able to yes survive? Yes. Dangerous, close call, but yes. I say dangerous and close call because we've loaded the game pretty badly. Between the money, between the gerrymandering, between the processes that we've set up uh, that uh, create un undue partisanship within the Congress, the PACs, um, very, 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 very tough. But do I think it will survive? Do I think we can address it? Yes. But it will require a lot of close attention and sort of suspension of cynicism on the part, on the part of the American people themselves. And I believe that's possible. I've already said in the big picture, we frequently see corrections when people think things have gone too far. I think they, they, there's a sense they've gone too far. There's things out of control. We're making mistakes. As a result of this, let me use those words advisedly. We are making mistakes as a result of what we've created. Mistakes that are not going to be easy to correct, whether it's programs that are eliminated so they cannot be reinstated, so people are going to do without, and some of these inequalities get worse, or whether it's things like climate change, no matter where you are on this, there's there, 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 at a minimum, there's things we need to be doing to mitigate the effects of what is undeniably now more violent weather and, 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 and hotter weather coming and so forth. Whether you agree there's a, a human element to it or not, or whether we can do anything about that, there is things we need to be doing in preparation. But we have to talk about the problem. So, uh, have, so, so, so damaging things are, 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 are on the horizon, and I think the American people will say, all right, I'm going to suspend my traditional loyalty or my traditional beliefs in order to, just as an individual, work to get this right. I have great, great faith in the collective wisdom of the American people, the body politic, voters. And so, yes, I think we will survive this. Um, and uh, it's not because the demographics are changing or anything of that nature. It's because I, I have this faith that the American people will, will see it. Uh, and 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 correct where necessary. We've 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 always done it, but again, there is no guarantee that says the 200-year domination of of, of 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 the American idea will go on forever. There are plenty of reasons why at some point we just run out of resources or run out of energy or run out of out of out of. Uh, would uh, make 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 really bad decisions, um, and you have to look at some of these things and wonder whether they don't have the potential to be that point of inflection, where we go into mediocrity or worse for a long haul, and I I hate that idea, because I think this is the greatest country on earth and needs to continue to be a beacon not just for our own people and their ambitions for the strivers the new people who've arrived and want to make something of their lives and help those who are already here and continue the greatness of the country, but also for other nations that have always respected who we are and what we stand for. Uh, those are real ideas. Those are real things that are put in jeopardy if we're not careful. Well, we're getting close to our end of our time, and I have two more questions for you, so I'm going to ask you to okay. take it. Slow. Take it. Oh, take, take it short. Be take short. Be short. And since one of them's about Donald Trump, okay. um, I know that this is unfair. <laughs> and so we have a number of questions about President Trump. Uh, one person wonders if he oversimplifies and really can explain complexity uh, and, and worries about respect for people. But the question I think that is actually most interesting within the context of what we're talking about is that he has taken to speaking directly to the American people mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a positive or a negative leadership tactic, and will it become the norm? 
I think it's probably a positive leadership tactic to speak directly to the people, uh, to use the modern availability of a technique and communicate as he wants to. I don't agree with the content of the communication or even the style of the communication. But he certainly has the right, and the technique is available. And I think it's a positive thing. In this day and time, when people can speak directly to themselves, I think they're complimented, curious, uh, uh, intrigued, uh, and interested in hearing directly from the commander in chief, as has never been possible before. So I don't think that is a problem. Okay? Now, I think there are two ways to think about the problem of, 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 of some of the, of the things that Donald, President Trump has done and said. One is people uh, object to them on grounds of civility, that this is not the way a president ought to behave. I think it's a serious question. Um, and we're not used to presidents talking this way. Oh, re really sort of coarse communication, but also impolitic, impolite. Um, and it bothers people who are used to some level of civility in our politics. Okay? And that's, that's bad, but that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is the content of some of those messages that, 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 that actually do damage in the world to our intelligence networks, to people in positions of responsibility. I would hate to be Rex Tillerson at this point and be treated the way that the Secretary of State of the United States is being undercut. Right? And, and then the content of things that are, in some cases, just wrong. Uh, the, the, the characterizations of the aid to Puerto Rico, which were clearly was not succeeding at the time that the assertions were made, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think he certainly has a right to use whatever communications vehicle, and it's probably a positive thing. And yes, it will change things forever because presidents are going to be boring if they don't do things like that in the future. We're not going to elect them because they're too boring. Um, uh, part of the appeal of Donald Trump today is he is entertaining. I mean, I have to go to my BlackBerry every second hour to see what the latest is. And I've been doing that for a year now uh, just to find out you know, what happened in the two hours since I was in a meeting that's significant. I, I will say this, I have, I, 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 I don't think one should underestimate President Trump on some of these issues. He has a genius. One of those is the ability to pin, peel back the layers of a complex situation and find a core truth and speak it, uh, including characterizations of people. Little Marco, uh, Lion Ted, uh, Crooked Hillary, uh, uh, et cetera. I mean, there, uh, who would have thought that we would ever acknowledge that uh, Jeb Bush is low energy until he said it, and then people said, oh, okay, maybe so, I'm going to check. <laughs> so he does have a, a genius at being able to do that, and he does have a genius at another genius, which is going to the edge of what is respectable to say, what no one has said before, going just beyond it, and then pulling back or going forward, depending on what the political circumstances allow. So this is a different kind of politics that we've seen before. And it does appeal to a, a block. And we'll see whether or not in electoral politics it's enough to get a person reelected. But uh, uh, I, I, I don't think the problem is in the, is in the, in the mechanisms. It's in, in the mediums. Uh, it, it, it's in the content of what, what, what's being put on the table. Okay, the last question, it's a brief one. Who would you like to see? Mm. Uh, give us three names, for instance. That's a hard question. What? Hang on, hang on. You I haven't mean, asked it, it yet. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> asked it. <laughs> Who could come, rise up, and I'm going to read it literally, rise up in 2020 and return the leadership qualities you mentioned to our country? And Eric wants to know, is one of those Henry no, Cisneros? No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. No. I've had my, my, my time in politics, and I respect the process, but I've, I've got other things I need to do. <laughs> <coughs> um, good question on the names. Um, 
there are the people who have been around a long time, like Joe Biden and uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. And then there are complete newcomers, like Eric Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles, and Kamala Harris in California. And uh, then sort of people in between, like Governor Hickenlooper in uh, Colorado. There's about 15 names on the lists that I have seen, including some who are not in politics today, like Oprah Winfrey and, 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 and Mark Cuban, et cetera. Uh, I don't know what the American people want. Uh, I would say if there was an election next week and the choices were Donald Trump or Joe Biden, that Joe Biden would be elected. That's what I would say. Okay. But I don't know whether the Democratic Party, as it's created today, as it's evolved today, wants a new face. I don't know which of the many new faces that would be. Right? And I don't know whether they will choose someone so unproven and so far to the left and so untested that when they come under fire of the kind that Donald Trump can bring to bear, they can survive it. Uh, so I, 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 I truly don't know. But I think if I had to today, if it were up to me and to say, well, the election is going to occur, who would you put up against Donald Trump today? I would say probably it's the person who could win the election is Joe Biden. That's my sense. Um, now, that's not a preference. I'm not you know, directly involved in the process. And there's a lot of water under the bridge, uh, a lot of water to come under the bridge. And it may well be that some young star who would have seen Barack Obama coming. He was a two years, four years before the election, he was a state senator in Illinois who people asked me to see on a trip to Chicago. And I said, I just don't have time to see a state senator <laughs> named Barack Obama. <laughs> that, that was a good decision. <laughs> that was a good decision. <laughs> that well, speaks to my political acumen. Will you, uh, <laughs> first, thank you to the ladies, as always. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> thank you to Doug and the wonderful, uh, gracious re reception we always get here. And will you please join me in thanking Secretary Cesar? Thank you, David. Thanks, much. Really okay. fun. Thank you. And now, <coughs> outside. Let's uh, give a round of applause for David Sloan as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. An extraordinary moderator. Uh, and thank you all for coming tonight. It's a little directing traffic. We, you know, now you have the chance to check your Blackberries, although I didn't think anybody had a Blackberry <laughs> anymore. That's extraordinary. <laughs> And uh, get a get a glass of wine and uh, and uh, unbelievable. I I just want to say about the secretary's comments. Now that is how you make George Washington relevant. I mean that was extraordinary. And I'd like to put him on the road, talking about our great leader here. So thank you all for coming out, and we'll see you soon. That was great. Thank you. Dr. Bradley. Dr. Bradley. Great stuff. Oh,